We were going to start out in Psalm 94. So the challenge, as always, when filling in for Pastor Kevin is obviously what to, what to share with you guys. And, and tonight we're going to get into a subject that a lot of times people don't talk about, especially men. There's a couple of guys, probably about four or five guys that I've talked to that deal with the same thing that we're going to discuss. So we're going to start out in Psalm 94. And as you're turning there, I'm going to read some, I guess there's symptoms and you'll, you'll see where I'm going with it. So we've got overwhelming fear of losing control, palpitations, sweating, trembling, shortness of breath, sense of choking, chest pain, nausea, dizziness, numbness or tingling in the limbs, chills or hot flushes. So you were like, uh-oh, is this one of the new medicines? And that's the, the very bottom of the... Now this is, those are all symptoms of either an anxiety attack or a panic attack. So if, you, if you're human, at some point in your life, you're going to go through, depending on the degree of your situation, uh, through this. So tonight we're going to look at what does God say about anxiety? What does God say about getting out of that? and not letting that take control. So we're going to begin in Psalm 94, and we're going to read a few verses, and then we're going to go to two other sections. So look at verses 16 through 19. That's where we're going to start tonight. So I'm going to read Psalm 94, 16 through 19 to begin with. So it says, Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would have settled in silence. If I say, my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for bringing us here safely tonight, Lord, and getting us through this day, Lord. I pray that as we open your word, Lord, we pray that you would meet us here through your spirit, Lord. Reveal things in our own life, Lord. Comfort us through your scripture, Lord. Correct us through all the things that your living word does, Lord. We thank you, Father. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So if you look with me at the very first verse, 16, and I wanted to kind of start there, even though we're going to make our way, obviously, through these verses. But to begin with, the psalmist, and we're not sure exactly who, who this psalm is attributed to, but Either way, the Holy Spirit inspired this writer to write these things. So we, right off the bat, we see that the question is, who's going to rise up and who's going to stand up? And when we're going through a situation and you don't have God on your side and you're not a believer, you're going to ask that. But for us, we have the amazing gift of the Holy Spirit within us. So let's look at the beginning of verse 17. It says, unless the Lord had been my help. So tonight, I'm going to give you guys a whole bunch of verses. So if you take notes, write these verses down. I gave a whole bunch to Amber. She's going to show quite a few. uh, Tiffany, sorry, not Amber. uh, Quite a few on the screen. So the first one related to this, unless the Lord had been my help, is Hebrews 13.6. So Hebrews 13.6 that you see on the screen is actually a quote of Psalm 118.6. So if you take notes, you can write, Hebrews 13.6 as well as 118.6, Psalm 118.6. So it says, so we boldly say, the Lord is my helper. The different in the Psalm verse of that, it says, the Lord is on my side. So you, you notice that. And it says, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Again, as we go through these verses, keep, it, keep in mind that we're, we're looking at how um, God looks at anxiety and how our focus, when it's correctly but the first thing we see the psalmist saying is, is, unless the Lord had been my help. And we know, remember Jesus, when he walked on the earth, he said, what? The Lord is, or I pray the Father, and he's going to give you another, a comforter, a helper, the Holy Spirit. So those of us who are believers, we get indwelt with the Holy Spirit when we accept him. He is our helper. He's within us. So the second part of verse 17 says, my soul would have soon settled in silence. Interesting. I'm reading the New King James. So if you, you have the King James, some people do it. It says, 
my soul would have dwelt in silence. Or we know that the word tabernacled is used also through scripture. And we know that, what does it say in John? The word became flesh and dwelt with us. So the psalmist is saying, unless the Lord had been with me and unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would have settled or dwelt in silence. And in that word in this particular moment, it literally means, or it's a figuratively meaning death. Psalm 115, 17 says, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. So as we're looking at these verses, there's, for the believer, there's always hope. And in this verse, in this obscure verse in Psalm 94, we actually see salvation, a salvation message if you look at it. Unless the Lord had been my help, in other words, unless I accepted Christ and have the Holy Spirit within me, my soul would have settled in silence. My soul would be forever separated from him. And so what, even within this verse, we see God's amazing message. So as we, we go into Revelation, the last book of the Bible, we get this glimpse of this heavenly scene, this future promise. And I think I gave Tiffany this verse, verses rather, Revelation 21, 3 through 4. And it says this, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, the same word meaning to dwell, to settle, of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more anxiety, as we're looking tonight. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So we see in this just in verse 17 tonight, if we didn't have the Lord, if we didn't have the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, we would be lost. We would, be, we would have settled in silence. Interesting that the New King James, as I'm reading, says settled in silence. I looked at a, a few other translations. In NIV it says, my soul would have settled in the silence of death, and the NLT is the silence of the grave. So we, you know, we get the point that if God is not with you, if you don't have the Lord, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're separated from him. But conversely, we see this amazing gift of the Holy Spirit through this. So let's look at verse 18. It says, if I say my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. So now the psalmist is saying it. If there's a situation that comes in my life, when my foot slips, your mercy will hold me up. So it's almost like we just saw in verse 17 this picture of salvation. If I did not have the Holy Spirit, I would have been separated. Now, we're, now we see in verse 18 almost the life of the believer. Because I think we could all say at some point in our life, our walk is not directly always in the will of God. Our foot will slip at times. We're going to go you know, towards the flesh and not towards the will of God. But in verse 18 we see, if I said this, it says, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. So as we're looking at, at the Old Testament, the Hebrew word, so it's different as well as in the Greek. So the three words, thy mercy held me up. You know, in English, that's five. But in, in the Hebrew, it's one word, and it means to support or to comfort. And we just read about the comfort or the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we can hold on to this promise that in the, in the New King James here, it says, if I say my foot slips, your mercy will hold me up. We know this is like a, a future promise. Interesting that the King James says, your mercy held me up. So either way you look at it, in the past, in the future, it's always his mercy that's going to hold us up. So mercy, we're, we're you know, we, we hear the description of it. You know, grace is getting what we don't deserve or getting, yeah, getting what we don't deserve and mercy is not getting what we do deserve, which is, you know, eternal separation from him. But what does God's word say? How does God describe it? And how does, let me give you the first verse. Psalm 25, 6, David refers to it as tender mercies. What does God say about the mercy that he gives? Isaiah 54, 7, he calls it great mercies. I did not give them these verses. I'm just giving them to you guys. Isaiah 55, 3, he says, the sure mercies of David. And we know David's life, right? 
what, it, what happened with Bathsheba and Uriah. We know that's an example that we always go to. So the mercies that God displays and explains, they're tender, they're great, and they're sure. I mean, these are promises we can all have because we know, our, as it says here in verse 18, that our foot will slip. We will not always be in the will of God. You probably heard these verses, Lamentations chapter 3, 22 through 24. This is a, something for you to wake up and always know this. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. We deserved separation, death, but because he's merciful, we are not consumed. Because what? His compassions, and that word literally means favor, grace, that fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. And this is something to wake up when you wake up in the morning. Thank you for your compassion, your mercy that's new every morning. Because I don't know about you, I'm going to send tomorrow morning, and I'm going to send the next morning after that. We need it every morning. So let's continue. Look in verse 19, at the beginning of verse 19. And this gets us to the topic of anxiety. Look what it says. The psalmist says, in the multitude of my anxieties within me. King James says thoughts, anxieties, disquieting thoughts. So it begins in the mind when this anxiety, the things that we talked about, the physical parts, the palpitations, the sweating, all that is related to what's going on in our mind, what's happening. And the psalmist is letting us know this isn't just some superficial thing it says the multitude of my anxieties. It's not just a one and done. I, had, I was anxious one day and then the rest of my life I was fine. It says the multitude. They're numerous. This is a continual thing in life. And it says within me. It's very profound. It's deep. It's not superficial. So this word anxieties, as I mentioned in the King James, it's thoughts. That word is used one more time in, in the Old Testament. And it's Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24. And this is David writing. You've probably heard these before. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, my, my disquieting thoughts. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the everlasting. You know, David is crying out, Search me, know my heart, try me, and then lead me. And we see that during this bouts of anxiety, we could cry out just as David did, Lord, search me in this situation. At the end of verse 19 in Psalm 94, we see the result of when we're, we give the it, times when this anxiety and the panic hits us. It says, your comforts delight my soul. There's always hope for the believer. No matter the situation, no matter what's going on in your life, it, for the moment, it will pass. But there's always hope. It says, your comforts delight my soul. In that word, it means mercy. The, mer the word that's being used could literally mean, your mercy delights my soul. So we see as us, as believers, we have the comforter within us. We can, we can rely on the Holy Spirit to get us through these situations when our mind goes somewhere where it shouldn't allows us to take our mind off of Christ. Because remember what happened to Peter in the boat, right? When he saw him, he said, come, come on out. And when he took his, you know, took his eyes off of him, looked at the waves, he sunk. You know, to, and that's similar in our own life. When we take our eyes off of him, we let everything else happen. All these symptoms that I just read. So now I want you to turn to the New Testament. Go to Matthew 22. Matthew 22 is where we're going to be. And we're only going to look at one verse for this second section. There's three sections, so we're on two of three now. So Matthew 22. So as a background where we're at, we're in verse 37. So what's going on in the life of Jesus Christ at this moment is he's, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they're always trying to trip him up, trying to hoodwink them and, and bamboozle them and, and trick them into something. So they come up this scheme. They said, I'll tell you what, we'll trip them up. So they ask him, one of the Pharisees, who happened to be a lawyer as well, said, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And we're familiar with this. 
Matthew 22, 37 says, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So we notice, again, we've seen this verse. If you're a believer for any time, we, we know this verse. A few things stick out right off the bat that this type of love that God desires in this relationship with him, it's an all-out love. It doesn't say, love me with part of your heart, part of your soul, and part of your mind. It says all. In all of the, those verses, all of those descriptions, every part of who we are. So let's look at the first one, heart. We're familiar with that, right? We're, it's a part of our anatomy. In the Old Testament, it was referred to as the inner part of man, the most interior organ as it was described as. So in the New Testament, if we look at the Greek word that's being used here, it's cardia, where we get cardiologists, things related to the physical heart. And similar to the Old Testament, it's also the center of all physical and spiritual life as described by the Greeks. So we see loving God with all of our hearts. So you're saying, well, what does that have to do with a panic attack, being in anxiety? Well, when we're focusing everything on him, and we're loving him with all of our heart, the first part, you'll see where I'm going. Proverbs 12, 25 tells us. PK went over this way back when we were in chapter 12. Proverbs 12, 20, 25 rather says, anxiety where in the heart of man causes depression, but conversely, a good word makes it glad. This heaviness in the heart, this anxiety in the heart causes us to be depressed, but conversely, a good word. So what exactly is a good word, right? Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We're holding the good word. Every part of this is the good word. So we know that, that gladness in our heart instead of anxiety and depression, when we're focused on him and his word, Another verse, Psalm 27, 14. It says, wait on the Lord. And that literally means to wait in faith or to expect. Wait in faith on the Lord. Be of good courage in what? He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So we saw in Proverbs earlier that there's gladness in the heart because of his word. Now we see him strengthening in our hearts through the word. Last one on the heart, Psalm 19.8. It says, the statutes, or we would say the commandments, the precepts, everything written in here of the Lord are right. Nothing is wrong. Nothing's incorrect, obviously. Rejoicing the heart. We saw gladness in the heart, strengthening the heart. Now, everything in here rejoices the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, and not only does it rejoice, strengthen, and make our heart glad, it enlightens the eyes. So we're getting this whole physical makeover just by loving the Lord God with all of our heart and focusing on his word instead of whatever the situations that's making all the things that I read earlier, the, the chills, the sweats, the palpitations, the worriness, like the world's closing in. Focusing on him and his love can do that to our heart. The next part we're supposed to love God with, it says with all of your soul. In the Greek, it's psyche. We, we hear that, right? And even in the world, world talk, the psyche. And the description is literally the seat of the will and purpose, your feelings, your desires, your affections, and also aversions, anything you don't like. The soul. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Again, you've heard majority of these verses I'm reading to you it says come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden you could even say and who are anxious and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me and how do we learn from him we learn here for I'm gentle and lowly in heart and what you will find rest for your souls so we see the heart and the gladness the strength the rejoicing the light enlightening in our eyes now we have rest for our souls because we're Loving God with every part of who we are. And lastly, we get to the mind. As we just read in Psalm, this anxiety literally means our thoughts, our mind. And this 
Mind literally here means to think over and through something. We know it, it, as Paul describes to the Ephesians, put on the whole armor of God and he tells us to put what? The helmet of salvation on our heads and that's protecting our thoughts and our minds because if you've got the helmet of salvation, you know no matter what you're going through, I'm going to be saved at the end from whatever the situation, but more so in the end, you're going to be eternally with him. Listen to this verse related to the mind. Again, you've probably heard this. Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. And you can see it up on the screen, but you can put your name here. It says, you will keep him or her. So God will keep you, your name, him or her in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because you, your name, he or her, trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength, the rock of ages. So we see loving the Lord God with our heart, our soul, and our mind allows us to, whatever the, those darts that come into our mind, the, the enemy trying to attack and, and take us off of his will and walking with him, if we're focusing on his word, it's going to help in those situations. So that's the second section. Last section, flip to Philippians chapter 4. And you guys are probably familiar with the verse that we're eventually going to get to in this chapter 4 because it's probably on a magnet on your refrigerator or it's in a t-shirt or, you know, this, this is like the go-to verse when we talk about being anxious. But we're going to, we're going to lead up to that point that particular verse because there's a there's a steps in the process as we learn through this about anxiety and panic and taking our focus off of the Lord so we're Philippians chapter 4 and we're going to be begin in verse 4 so <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 says simple verse small verse Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. There's some repetition for Paul. Twice he's telling us to rejoice. And, you know, it, it means to be the gladness and joy. We know what the fruit of the Spirit is, what love, joy, peace, right? If, if you don't memorize verses or you find it hard to memorize verses, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, you can memorize it tonight. And, be in, and get your memory verse for the week. Rejoice always. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Two words, rejoice always. Unfortunately, um, Paul is telling us always. And that's a hard, right? That's a very hard word, especially in the situation. And we notice it says rejoice in the Lord. It's not saying Rejoice in the fact that you just got this bad news about whatever. Rejoice that this particular situation happened. You're rejoicing in the Lord, not whatever it is, the diagnosis, the death. I mean, you name it. Anything that is going to throw you off away from your relationship with God. It says rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And I think we need to remember that, that he's not saying rejoice in whatever negative circumstance. Rejoice in the Lord who's a control over everything. So Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Look at verse 5 with me in Philippians 4. It says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Here we go with all. We had always up in <laughs> verse 4. Now we need to let our gentleness be known to all men, not just church folk, everybody we come across, right? It's easy to, to like and be friendly to people that are, are similar to us, have the same beliefs, but everybody else in the world is where it's difficult. But this is a command. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Gentleness, the word that's being used, listen to these different adjectives that, to also describe the same thing, graciousness forbearance you know long suffering we, we see that biblical word fairness and I like this one non retaliatory spirit <laughs> that's that's difficult at times to say the least and it's so it's it's telling us this gentleness this graciousness 
let it be known to all men. So in other words, this needs to be evident as a believer. This needs to be clearly seen, overwhelmingly evident. I mean, we can keep going describing it. It, it has to be beyond a shadow of a doubt that your gentleness is known to all men. Matthew five sixteen, you know the verse, let your light so shine before men so that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. It doesn't say let your light so shine before those at church. It says before men, before everyone. And that, again, that, that command and that encouragement from Paul, and he, and he ends the verse with the sentence, the Lord is at hand. He's coming back. Well, we know the end of the story. We go to the very end of the book. Even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Right? Let your gentleness be known to all men. So if there's nothing we get from tonight, it's when we leave here, let everyone know that you are a believer. Let your graciousness, your non-retaliatory spirit be known to all men. Which leads us to verse 6. The go-to verse when anyone's being anxious or having anything, we always know to go to this, but let's look at it. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So in verse four, we saw the focus was on the Lord Jesus. You probably heard this in children's ministry as a kid. That's the J. Verse five, we see, Everything related to others, the O, and now we see verse 6 is Y, J-O-Y, joy. You've probably heard that growing up. Jesus, others, yourself. But this is in these verses today. And it says in verse 6, be anxious. In other words, to be troubled with cares, to let things of this world or situations overwhelm you. And unfortunately, again, the way Paul writes this stuff, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says, for nothing. Really, Paul? For nothing? Be anxious for nothing? That's a little hard to do. Be anxious for nothing. And it excludes every single subject or situation you can, that will come across your life. He's telling us, don't be anxious for it. Don't be troubled with it. Well, it's a good thing the verse doesn't end there because he tells us how. That is going to be accomplished. But in everything. So conversely to nothing, now we include every subject and situation. It says, by prayer and supplication. And that supplication is what God, specific request or need that you have when you go to him in prayer. So what, what Paul is telling us, the Holy Spirit is telling us through Paul who wrote this, that these times of anxiousness, the times of, of panic, cry out to the Lord. He knows, it tells us in, in his word, he knows what we're, we're but dust. He knows what we're created. He knows that we're, we're sin-filled. We have that nature. He knows we're going to have these situations that are going to overwhelm us and we're going to have all these, these symptoms of physical things. But conversely, it says in everything by prayer, even before the anxiety or anything, any situation. So this is telling us this life of prayer, continual prayer, always talking to God. If we're always talking to him, the moment when whatever triggers this anxiety in your life, you would already been talking to him. He's right here by you. The spirit is in you. And you're thanking him. You're asking him, Lord, provide me with these things so I can glorify you. And we see how the prayer is done. It says with thanksgiving. So I always like to look at the heavenly scenes in Revelation when we, when we see different words and okay, so how does that fit in the future when we get to see, when we get to see different things? So Revelation seven twelve gives us a glimpse of the elders and the four living creatures. It says, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom. Here's our word thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So we see back here in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 that as we're praying with this thanksgiving, this heart of thanksgiving, thank you Lord for the mercies that were new every morning. Thank you for giving me breath in my lungs. Lead me through this day. 
we see this thanksgiving is going to continue when we get into heaven. Because it said there in Revelation, be to our God forever and ever. Thanksgiving, honor, power, and might, all that's, that's his. And it's all going to be in heaven. And the key at the very end of verse 6 of Philippians 6, it says, let your requests be made known to God. And that involves us praying, talking to him, listening to him through his word. But then talking to him, not just, you know, praying when, when we need it, when, when a panic attack's happening, but to be in this continual mode of prayer, talking to him. James 4, 3 tells us, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. You know, James is telling us quite the opposite of what we just saw in verse 6 in Philippians. When we're going to him in prayer with thanksgiving, letting our requests be made known to him. So let's continue. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we see, you know, Paul's telling us, the Holy Spirit's telling us through Paul that when you're anxious, when you're going through these things, you cry out to him and there's going to be this peace of God which pass, surpasses all understanding. If you've, if you've had this situation occur in your own life, you, don't, you can't explain why he got you through that at that moment. Because if you're having anxiety or a panic attack, it feels like it's eternity. But when it's over, it's like, how, what happened? I, I guess I did something right. I raised my leg or did whatever correctly. No, it was the peace of God. It surpasses anything we could even understand and the world can understand. And we also see that it will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We just read about loving the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And we read back in Psalm 94 about anxiousness in the heart, that these disquieting thoughts. And this peace of God that we can't understand here on earth is going to guard your hearts and minds similar to that helmet of salvation guard it literally means to put a military garrison around your mind and your heart so you know being close to military towns you know the special force of greenberg whatever top notch whatever imagine that but with with a biblical force the, the peace of god around your heart and mind john 14 27 you've heard it peace i leave i leave with you my peace I give to you. This is the Holy Spirit. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your heart not be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And this goes hand in hand with this anxiousness of our hearts. We have the, the, the Holy Spirit in us when this happens in our lives to cry out to the Lord. Lord, give me the strength of the Holy Spirit in me to get through this. And the key again is asking let your request be made known to God. That's the, the whole key to this of the biblical, I guess, cure for anxiety and panic attacks is cry out to the Lord. Ask him. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. We're going to cover this at men's breakfast this Saturday, but listen to what it says. Got it on the screen. It says, now to him who is able to do what? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. <laughs> we can, what does that mean? A, exceedingly, abundantly, above? We can even ask or think. So it, he's like, whatever you're asking, whatever you're thinking, it's way above. You can, we, it's beyond that. It's in some stratosphere. And it says in Ephesians 3, verse 20, according to the power that works in us. We don't have, you know, it's not the physical, it's not, Popeye and the spinach, it's the Holy Spirit within us giving us this in verse 21, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know, glory in the church, that's us, the body of believers. So when we ask and we, we rely on him, he's going to blow our socks off in our minds on what things can happen because of the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 5, 6 and 7. And this is a key to when we're asking and crying out to the Lord. Because as we're going through Proverbs, we understand that pride will get you nowhere but far from the Lord. 
First Peter 5, 6 and 7 tell us, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he may, he may exalt you in due time. Right? He may exalt you in due time. What does it say? Casting all of your care, casting all of your anxiety upon him, for he cares for you. He's a loving father. He doesn't desire you to struggle and be with, do all the things we just read about in situations. He said, just talk to me. Cry out to me. Matthew chapter 6, um, 25 through 34. Jesus talks about not worrying about situations. I'm not sure if I put it up. Yeah. So verse 25, you're familiar with this. It says, therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat. What you drink, your body, what you put on, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? And it goes on to talk about don't worry about things. You can't add an uh, inch to your height. You can't add length to your days. None of that. I will provide for you. But in that same section in Matthew 6, 33 and 34 is the key for us. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. We just talked about loving the Lord God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Now we're seeking that. Therefore, do not worry. Literally, take no thought. Be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Think about the things that we get anxious and worry about. Half of them never even come to fruition. What's going to happen tomorrow? This is going to happen. i got to go to the doctor. i got to do this. I'm going to have... And we could get, get there and none of it happened. But we, we t tossed and turned and have an ulcer because we've allowed our focus to go off, of, off the Lord. So we're going to end it with one more verse in this Philippians section. Verse 8. So we see that not to be anxious, to cry out to him, to thank him. And we see it all goes back to the mind. Verse 8 says, Finally, brethren... Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, just, pure, lovely, good report. Is there any virtue? Is there anything praiseworthy? Meditate. Literally, King James says, think. And that's what we've been talking about. What's in our mind? What are we thinking about? Make those things a subject of your thought, thoughtful consideration. Reflect on them. All these different words that, that Paul wrote through the Holy Spirit. Think on those things, not the news as you turn the news on, but think of things related to the Lord and how you can be a witness for him and how you can encourage others. Romans 12, 2 tells us, and do not be conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's all what's going on in our mind and we're allowing our minds to veer off and think of things that we can't control, but when we give it over to him, amazing things happen. Yes. Some end it with one last reference verse. So Second Corinthians chapter 10, or a few verses, sorry. It says, chapter 10, verse 3, Second Corinthians, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but what? Mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. And this is what I want to get to. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Bringing every thought into the captivity and the obedience of Christ is what we're told to do, we're commanded to do. And as we went through the, these sections, we see if we just rely on him, we call on him, these, these times of anxiety, the panic attacks, he's there to comfort us. We have the Holy Spirit. So that's the end of the section. Hopefully you wrote the verses down. You go back and dig deeper. I know there's a whole lot in there that obviously we don't have time to cover all of it, but that was the, the Cliff Notes version. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the comforter you do give us, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for those in the room that are going through anxious times, Lord. You tell us to cry out to you, Lord. We thank you for being there for us and desiring that relationship. You tell us to come. 
We thank you for being so loving, Lord, in, in your mercy that is new every morning, Lord. We, we thank you for that. We don't deserve it, but you are amazing. Father, I pray that we would be joyful, as your word told us tonight, as we were reminded, Lord, as we go to work or whatever we're doing tomorrow, Lord, that we would be a light everywhere we go so people would know that we're different and ask why we're different, Lord, and the joy that we have because of, of you. Thank you, Father, for tonight, Lord. I pray for Pastor Kevin and Lydia as they're away at her play, Lord. Others that could not make it tonight, Lord, and those that are going through difficult situations, you would cover them, Lord. Thank you, Father. In your son's name we pray. Amen.